So those of you who don't know me, um, I manage the Health Education and Law Project, or HELP, and I've been doing that since 2009. Um, we collaborate with most of the hospitals here in Omaha to provide free legal services to patients, anything that we see as a health harming legal need, something that is getting in the way either of um, their ability to get health care or something that is inhibiting their health. So part of what I do is come talk to hospitals about different areas of law, not because I want you guys to be lawyers and be able to give legal advice, because I want you to recognize a legal problem when a patient brings it up so that we can make sure that everybody that should be getting to us and getting our services is getting to us. Um, I know that nursing home involuntary discharge is, <laughs> I always want to call it patient dumping, and I'm not allowed to do that. So um, I know that it is a hot topic, and I know that it comes up. It comes up in all of the hospitals, not just yours. Um, and so I recently actually attended a webinar that was talking about this issue, and there were new things that came up that even I did not know. And so I offered to come kind of talk about it. As I'm talking, if you have questions about anything that I am talking about, please interrupt me and ask the question. I'll re, um, since you're filming, I will reiterate the question and then I will answer it um, so that we have that on. But I would prefer it to be interactive if you guys have questions as I'm talking. Um, so any nursing home that takes either Medicaid or Medicare dollars or a combination of both fall under the, no, the nursing home reform law, which is a federal law. Nebraska has its own regulations um, and so where those two may meet or they may cross paths, the one that is more strict with regard to the nursing facility is the one that is going to come into play. So there are a couple instances where perhaps the federal law is more strict even than Nebraska, and the federal law then overrides what Nebraska um, actually says. So all of them, as long as they take any sort of Medicaid or Medicare dollars, are going to fall under the nursing home uh, reform law. And it protects residents regardless of where their payment form is. So you don't have to be a Medicaid or Medicare patient to be protected by this law. It affects anybody. So if you're a self-pay and you're in a nursing facility, you still fall under this. There are only six reasons that you can be ev ev evicted, is the word I'm going to use as a lawyer, that you can be kicked out of or discharged um, involuntarily from a nursing facility. Uh, and this is skilled nursing facility. This is not assisted living. I'll get into assisted living in a little bit. This is a skilled nursing facility. Um, one of them is for non-payment. You're not paying your bill, and that may mean that you suddenly don't Medicaid qualify, and so you don't have money coming in. You're endangering the safety of others. You're endangering others' health. You need a higher level of care than they say they can provide. You're not needing the level of care that they have. In other words, you've, you've gotten better. Um, or the nursing facility is closing, which I know has happened um, in a couple of places around the state. In any event, in all of these instances, the, ner the resident has a right to appeal that discharge, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So, um, medical necessity is one of them. If the resident's needs can no longer be met by the nursing facility, the patient can be transferred. So, if suddenly something has come up where their needs are higher than I think we have one in our office now where they're saying they can't meet the needs of the patient, they can be discharged for that reason. Um, it needs to be documented as to why they can't meet that level, and it needs to be substantiated or backed up by that person's physician. If it is something where they immediately cannot meet that person's needs, they don't need to give written notice to the patient in order to transfer them. They do, however, have to have a plan of transfer. They can't just say, get out of our facility because we can no longer meet your needs. So they don't have to give written notice if it's something that they can't meet the needs, but they do have to plan for discharge. Um, and that means sending them to the hospital? That does not mean sending them to the hospital, and I'll get to that in a minute. I know that's one of the plans that they often use. Um, Emergency safety is another one. So when a resident is a danger to him, him or herself and others, including the residents, the staff, the resident may be transferred or discharged. Um, this, too, has to be documented and substantiated by the physicians. 
and you don't have to give written notice if you are discharging him discharging them for that reason now this is kind of a fine line and when I talk about um, that they are entitled to administrative hearing and they are entitled to some things to appeal this this is one of those cases where I think that probably comes up the most because we have cases where it is a fine line between being a health hazard or a hazard to patients and staff and just being a pain in the rear and a difficult patient. You know, dementia patients are going to be difficult. That doesn't mean that they fall into the standard. We had one particular case um, where the nursing home discharged because the guy was getting verbally, he, he wasn't very nice to the staff. And really what it came down to is if the staff just would have let, let him have another cup of coffee and a cookie past 10 o'clock in the morning, he would have been fine. But they refused to do that. So he never threatened staff. He just was difficult to deal with, and they tried to discharge him on that. Um, we were able to resolve that issue. So that is one of, this is probably the one that comes up the most, where they say they're a, they're a danger to themselves. They don't have it backed up by a physician, and really what they're saying is a danger to themselves and to others is not really rising to that level. Um, Rehab is another reason that they can be transferred, and we all know, so if you're in a skilled nursing facility and suddenly you have gotten better to the point where you don't need that level of care, Medicaid's not going to pay for it anyway. Um, and so at that point, they can be transferred to another facility. Um, and they have to give at least five days written notice when they're going to transfer because the person no longer needs that. So that is one where they do have to give written notice. Really the two that are a we don't have to give notice are going to be the they can no longer meet that level of care and where the person is violent and somehow is endangering others. Um, Non-payment. If a resident is discharged for non-payment, they have to be given 30 days written notice. And non-payment means reasonable notice combined with failure to pay. So they told them you're not paying for the facility. They have to give them 30 days written notice. That doesn't mean they can drop them off at the hospital and say, oops, they didn't pay, so we can't take them back. Um, if the resident has applied to or is receiving Medicaid, they may not be discharged until their Medicaid support has been canceled or their application for Medicaid has been done, denied and non-payment continues. Um, when less than 10% of the nursing home's residents are receiving Medicaid, the resident has been living there for one year or more and their economic status has changed so they would qualify for Medicaid, they cannot be discharged under the Nebraska Nursing Home Act. So if they suddenly need to get Medicaid, then they can't be discharged. They have to wait and apply them for Medicaid. Um, the big thing when it comes to the non-payment is to know that they have to give them 30 days written notice. And normally they have to give written notice to the family as well. So not just the patient. So you have a patient who has dementia, they don't understand what's going on in those instances, especially if there's a guardian. They absolutely have to give notice to the guardian if they're going to do something. So what is notice? Um, a message that includes the reason for the discharge. You have to explain why the person's being discharged, the effective date of the discharge, and the location of the transfer of the resident. So I think what we run into a lot with these nursing facilities is they dump them at the hospital or they say we're discharging you and they don't have a plan for discharge. They just say you're done. They're required under law to try to find a transition plan and find some place to discharge them rather than just kicking them out on the street. Um, I guess the, the only argument to that would be in the instance where they um, no longer require nursing facilities. I suppose in that instance you could argue they could be discharged home or discharged out of the facility if they no longer require any sort of care at all. But that's the only instance I can think of. Um, the language specified by statute, which notifies the resident of their rights to an appeal. So they have to be told they have a right to appeal the discharge. Contact information for the state, state's long-term care ombudsman. And um, they can't be retaliated against anybody who's complained against the nursing home. So if you file a complaint, that's not a reason that they can kick you out. But the two things that have to be in the notice is um, when it's coming in, that you have a right to appeal, so I guess there's three, and the phone number or the contact information for the state's ombudsman. Um, you have to give a copy of it to the resident, 
and it has to be also given to their legal representative. So if they have a, have a guardian. I'm chuckling because we had one case, the one particular case where um, they kicked him out because he wasn't, he wasn't being very nice because they wouldn't give him cookies and coffee. Um, we complained, we, we actually appealed, and then we said that they didn't give him proper notice. So they somehow snuck into the hospital and left notice on his side table and then left and said, nope, we've given him notice now because they snuck and left it on his side table. Um, interesting thing about that case, they also, um, he had a guardian and they didn't give notice to the guardian and not only did they not give notice to the guardian, but they had the guy sign his own DNR, um, which is one of the reasons that we were able to settle that case. Um, okay, so what if the facility says, we're not taking them back? What if they discharge? Um, they have to comply with the transfer discharge. So they've got to look at where else can we discharge them. And I know a lot of things what they're doing is they are discharging them and just putting them at the hospital. Um, how many of you have had to deal with where they've been dropped off and the, ho and the facility just says we won't take them back? I know Carrie has. Um, how many of you, after talking to us and giving them the information about notice requirements, have gotten the nursing facility to take them back? <laughs> So that is, that is one of the things and, and one of the reasons that I really want you guys to know what the hospital's rights are as far as, or not the hospital's rights, but really what the nursing facility is required to do. Because sometimes if they call and say, we're not taking them back, and you have this knowledge and say, I know you can't just discharge them, and it's up to the hospital. I know that some hospitals do not want to file complaints with the ombudsman, um, and some hospitals do. So if you and I don't know Methodist stance, I know one of my hospitals doesn't want to do that, but depending upon what your in-house counsel wants to do, if you can file a complaint or at least contact the state ombudsman or at least threaten to say you're going to do that, sometimes they will take them back. But you need to know this is an instance where they don't have to give notice, but still give um, the patient an opportunity to come over to us, especially if it's one of those cases where, um, <clears throat> where the patient allegedly is a, is a harm to himself. If the patient or the patient's family wants them to go back to the facility, then it's something that could be referred to us. We would not be representing the hospital in the dump. We would be representing the patient and file something on the patient's behalf to make the facility take them back. Um, the other problem that we see once they've been involuntarily discharged, especially when they've been left at the hospital, is, as you guys all know, it's then difficult to get another facility to take them because they've kind of been red flagged, um, thinking, okay, they're difficult or there's a reason that they got involuntarily discharged. So it's even harder to then get them placed, which is why it's important to get them, A, either put back in the facility or, B, tell the facility it's their obligation to find another facility for them to go to rather than just leaving them um, at the hospital. So if, if they were given the 30-day notice five days ago and they came to the hospital and then they're ready to go in a couple of days, we still can send them back because they're still in their Absolutely. 30 day notice. Absolutely. They're still within their 30-day notice. And so the, hospital, so the nursing facility cannot legally discharge them and just say, here, hospital, they're your, they're your problem. They, by law, have to take them back for that 30-day period because they haven't been given that proper notice. Are they responsible to help replace them or does that then become the responsibility of the resident and or family guardian? They have to do some sort of planning. They can't just, especially in that instance, they have to do some sort of planning to assist with finding a different facility. Um, they can't just say, you're out and kick them out the door. So they're required to do some sort of discharge planning. If 30 days comes and goes and they um, well, I mean, th th they're never allowed to dump them in the hospital. The person still has the right to appeal that to try to get back in. Um, and then it's up to the hospital. So if, if the person is here, they dump them at 30 days, then it's still their right to go back and have an appeal process. And it's up to the hospital as to what they want to do with regard to this patient that's been left here. Because it's not a proper, a person, assuming the person doesn't need, I know what I see a lot um, is the person needs medication management. So they get brought to the ER and the hospital says, we really don't need to do anything. Um, 
take them back in the nursing facilities, it's like hot potato. No, not, not doing it. Um, and in that instance, it's, it's a matter of what the hospital's policy is going to be with regard to whether they want to contact the stand ombudsman or how they want to deal with that. I'm only telling you broadly what the law is. Um, but I know each hospital has a different policy on how they want to handle that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about bed holds because I know that was something that, that came up in the webinar that I was on. Um, so bed holds, Nebraska, and I always get, I'm sure you guys know the number of days that they will hold a bed for a Medicaid patient who is at the hospital. What I didn't know and what I learned from this webinar is beyond those days, um, if the patient is in the hospital, is it eight days that they hold them here, the bed hold, it's 15? So the 15-day bed hold. So say the person is in the hospital for 15 days, Medicaid bed hold is in place, and you are now on day 18. By law, by federal law, which um, this was one of those instances where I said sometimes the federal law is more stringent than Nebraska law. Nebraska law does not talk about this. Federal law does, and so federal law trumps. They, even beyond that day, have to allow that person to come back the first bed they have open. So if you have somebody that's in the hospital and you're beyond your 15-day um, bed hold, they still, the facility still has to take them back in their um, the next bed that they have open. So the next open bed needs to go to that patient. They have to hold it at least for your patient. So they don't have to hold it beyond the 15 days, but the minute they have an opening, that patient should go back. And I don't think a lot of the facilities are doing that, um, that I'm aware of. I think they just, okay, 15 days are up. We don't have to take them back. So... They'll, they'll say that we only have five Medicaid-approved beds, so maybe they will fill the bed that person was in, and so now they have no Medicaid beds. And that may be the case. If they have a Medicaid bed that opens, and I don't know how often that cycling is, um, but if they have a bed that opens, they've got to take that patient back. Um, and again, I don't know how quickly things turn over in, in skilled nursing facilities so that they have an opening in the bed. But I don't think that most of them are going by with the understanding. I think they, real, they think that once that person is gone. And I realize that we're dealing with patients. I think this, this person that we were dealing with, he was at the hospital for, God, I want to say like almost a year before we got involved in the case and um, got him, got it worked out so that he got placed somewhere else. So <clears throat> Unfortunately, sometimes it's a longer term thing, but at least at some point they've got to take them back if they've got an opening within that. And I, and I don't think they've been doing that. Um, so let me give you some examples of what we have seen of improper justification for discharging a patient. Um, a resident is disruptive, picks fights, or is hard to control. That does not fall within the you know, difficult and a you know, is, is somehow affecting the safety of others. Just because they're difficult does not mean that they are affecting the safety of others. The concern is, is that there are only five Medicaid beds, and so their thought is, well, there's 50 people that will take this bed if we kick this person out. Unfortunately, by law, they still can't do it just because the person's being difficult. Um, the resident is noncompliant. Well, I'm sure most of you know, with those who have dementia, most of them are non-compliant. My mother has dementia. I know she's non-compliant. When I get reports from the nursing facility that she hasn't thrown water at anybody this week, it's like, way to go, Mom. Um, so, and she was, in, in her younger life, was one of the kindest-hearted people ever. But, so we all know, and especially with nursing facilities that are dealing with dementia, um, that that is a characteristic, unfortunately. So... I get a little frustrated when nursing homes look to throw people out because they're being non-compliant when that is actually the population that they are, are dealing with in the first place. Um, the resident refuses to undergo the treatments that they need or that the facility wants them to do. Unless the person has a guardianship over them and the guardian says they have to have this um, done, they don't have to have it done. It is still up within them until somebody takes that right away from them. So even though the doctors in that facility may not agree with the patient's um, decisions, that doesn't mean that that is a reason that they can kick the person out. The resident's Medicaid payments are still in the application process. If they've taken the person in and Medicaid has not been denied, they can't kick them out for lack of payment until such time as Medicaid says, no, we're not going to pay and this is not going to be a payer source. If it's in the application process, um, they have to keep that person until that has been resolved. 
Um, here's a good one. A language barrier exists between the resident and the nursing home staff. We had one where they tried to kick them out saying they couldn't meet their needs because the person didn't speak a language that they had an interpreter for. Believe it or not, that's not an excuse. You can't kick them out because they don't speak a language that your staff speaks. That is becoming more and more of a problem as we have more and more individuals. I mean, I know that my office, um, we have a lot of individuals who speak Arabic and Sudanese and um, Karin is a big one. And so nursing facilities are required to work around that. It is not a reason to discharge someone because you don't have, it doesn't fall within that we can't meet the needs standard that they're looking at. Um, so, assisted living facilities, kind of the base rule for assisted living facilities, they can do whatever they want. Um, none of these rules pretty much apply to them. They can kick people out for whatever reason they want. Um, health and safety reasons, if the resident is a danger to themselves or others, the resident may be discharged. No written notice for that kind of discharge. A general discharge, a patient can be discharged as long as 30 days written notice has been given. So other than the health and safety reason, which is the same under the nursing facility, um, they have to give 30 days written notice for other reasons to kick them out, um, but they're not under the same written notice requirements. They don't have the same kind of, it's basically we're kicking you out in 30 days. They are not held to the same standard as the skilled nursing facilities. Um, really, there are no teeth when it comes to the assisted living facilities. They don't have the same rules that they fall under. So when you're talking about involuntary discharge and doing anything on involuntary discharge, we're talking about skilled nursing facilities for the most part. Um, so what can we do, or what as lawyers can I do, if somebody is dumped at the hospital or involuntarily discharged and left here. If it is a patient, again, something that the patient wants to go back and wants us to represent them in going back or having something done, we can actually file a temporary restraining order and ask for an injunction asking that the patient be moved back to the facility until such time as the patient has an administrative hearing. So we can go into court, we can file something um, on a temporary basis, a temporary emergency basis, asking the patient be put back in the facility until such time as, um, as we can get in for administrative hearing. I don't think we've ever had a patient who's willing to do that. Usually, unfortunately, the ones that we usually get, they have dementia, they have a guardian, um, or they don't have a guardian, they probably need a guardian and the family is upset that the facility treated them the way that they treated them and so they don't want to go back. But in those instances where you have perhaps a family member, especially when the person has been placed there for a long period of time, um, we can actually go to court and try to get them placed back in. It's going to be up to the judge as to whether, um, whether they want to put that in or not. I mean, our theory would be let's do, oh, I'm touching the mic. <laughs> Our theory would be let's do status quo, you know, let's keep this resident, especially when you have one um, who has a mental or physical condition where they've been in this facility a long time and it is a very huge disruption to them, to then be able to go in and say to the judge, we want to keep this person in place until we make some sort of determination, until the court makes a determination that they can be moved somewhere else. Um, my thought has always been and my hope has always been that if we do enough of these, if facilities start to hear that patients are going to do things so that they are discharged the way that they should be discharged, I'm hoping then that we wouldn't have to do any more. Um, you know, I think right now, I, I see the same thing with the school district where there aren't a lot of attorneys who do education law. And so when you have something that comes up in the school, usually there's not an attorney there that's going to represent and so I hate to say the schools do what they want to do, but for the most part, they go unchallenged in actions that they take. It's the same thing with the nursing homes. Um, you know, they're doing things and they're involuntarily discharging these patients, probably not the way that they should be, and they're never being challenged on it as far as from the patient's perspective, and so they keep doing it. So my hope is if it was done enough when the nursing facilities, and I'm sure they talk, where the nursing facilities know, you know, we need to do this the right way, that hopefully they would start doing it the right way and attorneys wouldn't have to get involved. It's, it's always good when I don't have to get involved in things or where you guys are armed enough where you know if somebody's been dumped at the hospital, you can say, you know, you need to take this patient back. Um, we're not going to keep them and hopefully you can get them to take them back 
that way. That to me is the smoothest way to do it. It's the easiest way for the patient. Obviously, it's probably the best for the hospital. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, file a complaint or contact your local ombudsman. So the state of Nebraska ombudsman, I, the one appeal that we did file um, with the gentleman with the cookies, the state ombudsman said they very rarely get anybody that appeals these. So I think he had like two in a year. So patients just aren't doing it for lots of reasons. Um, and so filing something with the state ombudsman or contacting the state ombudsman, and again, that's a hospital thing, so it's really up to the hospital whether that's something they want to do um, to contact and say this facility is not taking this patient back. The ombudsman can oftentimes get involved and assist the hospital in getting that person placed back. And I know if, they, if you file a complaint with DHHS that they then have to go in and do an investigation to determine whether the nursing facility is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I think when nursing facilities, when that starts happening, that is another thing that possibly is going to keep them or start them doing things the way that they're supposed to be doing things. Is, uh, is there a minimum amount of time that a person, let me try and phrase it right. So if a person goes to a facility and they're there five days and they're just the most difficult, out of the way person and they, they end up in the hospital and then the facility won't take them back, it, it, is it a length of time because they've only been there five days or does the person have to be there two weeks or 30 days in order for all of this to take place? So in my brain, um, I am way back remembering that it's a 30 day, but I am going to double check that and I will let you know um, because it seems to me that it's a, they have to be there 30 days before all of this kicks in. Um, before two because the one case that we had, she'd only been there for two weeks. I mean, they still jumped when we said we were going to be calling. <laughs> <laughs> they said what time we pick her up, but um, so I mean, it worked. <laughs> I'm not telling your people to threaten nursing homes. I'm really not. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it has been. Yeah, and that's, it seems to me that it's 30 days. I will double check and get back to you. But it seems to me that they have to be placed for 30 days. Um, yeah, I, it has been. And it's happened in a couple other hospitals where we've had the social workers or care managers have known kind of what these rules are. And so then when they're dealing with the nursing facilities, although we've had nursing facilities that say we don't care and they'll just won't take them back. Um, but you are going to get the ones that when they realize that they aren't following the rules correctly, that they are. Most that I know, most nursing facilities don't necessarily have an attorney that they can call and ask. Um, I, have off I have offered, I don't know why I keep touching that. Um, I have offered, and if it is ever something that comes up, I have offered to go talk to nursing facilities and give presentations just like this. You know, as, as legal aid, we give a lot of landlord-tenant um, information to landlords because we don't want to go to court because landlords aren't evicting people the proper way. They're not going through the way. I would prefer not to be standing here talking to you about what to do when they involuntarily discharge. So if it ever comes up and a nursing facility is willing to have an attorney come talk to them about what their regulations are and what their requirements are, I'm happy to do that on the flip point of things. Um, because hopefully if both sides know the rules, then you don't, well, you're always going to need me, but not for that. Um, so nursing homes, um, if within the written notice time period described above, the resident cannot file an appeal with the nursing home, or can file an appeal with the nursing home and with the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, if the person is involuntarily discharged, they have the right to file an appeal with the Department of Health and Human Services and try to get back in the place. Like I said, it'd be a twofold thing. On the one hand, um, we could go into court and ask for a temporary restraining order, and then they're entitled to a hearing, an administrative hearing, to determine whether they should be discharged or not. Um, the resident can also contact the ombudsman, so it doesn't have to be necessarily the hospital that wants to contact the ombudsman. If the family has a concern, the family can actually contact the ombudsman and file a complaint or do something themselves. So, you know, that is a right that the patient has as well. And honestly, if they're taught, if you have a patient or a family who was involuntarily discharged, send them to us. Um, 
as a referral because we can then advise them of what their rights are. So even if it's a thing where the hospital says we don't want to file a complaint with DHHS, the patient has the right to do that on their own. And we could advise them of that rather than putting the hospital in the position of having to tell them, well, gee, you can go call. So send them over to us. We can advise them of what their rights are, and they can actually file their own complaint with, um, with the ombudsman if they want to. Um, if it is found that the nursing facility did do something wrong, they can be fined up to $10,000. They can be prohibited from admitting or readmitting um, and a limitation on the enrollment of residents. So it can affect how many residents they can take in. And they can be on probation for up to two years or they can be suspended for up to three years depending upon how long or what they were doing and how egregious it was. Um, they can have their license revoked and then they can't resubmit for a new license for up to two years. And what the Department of Health and Human Services and the Ombudsman will look at is how serious the violation was, including probability of death of the patient, um, physical or mental harm. And the mental harm one, when I'm going back to, you know, you have somebody who's been placed in a facility for several years and all of a sudden they decide to get rid of them, that is one of the things that the department is going to look at. Um, the extent to which the statutes, regulations, and rules were violated, and that's going to be both state and federal regulations. Whether the staff reasonably attempted to fix the problem, whether they've had any past violations, and uh, what financial benefit the facility gained through its actions. So financial benefits going to be one of those where the person, you know, just your example, where the person hasn't paid and they gave them 30 days notice, but woo, five days from now we just drop them at the hospital and we're not taking them back because then they can fill that bed with somebody else. And um, they can fill that bed with somebody else and that's a financial benefit. So did they benefit by the fact that they kicked this person out um, is, is one of the things. So as far as involuntary discharge, that is all I have. I did want to talk about a couple of other things when it comes to nursing facilities that may come up when you're talking to patients or patients' families. Um, one of them is there is a federal law that prohibits nursing facilities for asking family members to guarantee the bill. And I'm, that is something that we're seeing more and more often is when people go into nursing facilities, the nursing facility wants the family member to sign saying they will guarantee the bill and they actually cannot ask for a third party guarantee. They also cannot ask for, um, they can't try to bill the person saying, well, this person promised they would use the um, tenants or the, the person who's in the nursing facility promised that they would use their money to pay the bill and because they're not doing that, um, we're going to say that they're liable for the bill. So that's just something to keep in mind, it used to be that they could ask the family member to voluntarily agree to pay as one of the things, and they recently changed that law where it's actually a violation to even ask the family member to voluntarily um, guarantee. And I know we get that a lot when we do guardianships, is people will ask us, um, am I going to be liable for the person's bill? And so now it's made it a little bit easier because now as a guardian or a family member, the facility actually can't ask them for a guarantee in order to say, well, in order for them to be placed in our facility, you have, to guarantee play you have to guarantee payment. So that comes up when you guys are talking about placement of these individuals in skilled nursing facilities where they're saying, well, we want some family member to guarantee. That's a violation of federal law, and they cannot do that. Um, Although I will say that they're not allowed to do it, they still will sue family members if family members do say that they will pay. So important to tell family members, do not guarantee it. It's a violation of federal law, but there have been lawsuits where the facilities, when the person has guaranteed, actually have won under that saying, well, they said that they would. Um, so that is another issue to deal with when family members are talking about, because I know you guys do a lot of placement in the facilities to begin with. Um, <coughs> So do you mean family member or the patient? The facility that's asking. Right. So who are they asking to pay? Are they asking that a family member pay or that the patient pay? Well, 
Because if it's the family member, then they're asking for payment from the family members and not the actual patient, and that they're not allowed to do. But if they ask the patient? Then the patient, if it's something that's a payment thing, that's, that's a payment. If it's a Medicaid-eligible patient, um, I would say no. But if it's something where they're asking for something up front, under then that's going to be looking at the nursing home contract and what's within that nursing home contract and how their payment's going to come in. Um, <clears throat> But that's, that's a different thing than having the family members pay, which is what I think they try to get family members to do because then if Medicaid falls out, they figure they're going to go after the family and it's, it's easier to do that. Um, I think... <clears throat> so that is all I have. Um, as, as far as written stuff that's useful. I will tell you that there are, um, there have been more and more lawsuits that have been filed against nursing facilities for violating all of these rules. A lot of the nursing facility agreements actually allow for attorney's fees, so you can get private counsel. Legal aid usually cannot get attorney's fees, but in instances like this, um, we can if it's actually written within an agreement. So it is a better reason for the nursing facilities to follow what the regulations are because it's, it's a bit more of a bite when it's not only, okay, you can be sued, we can be brought into court to get a temporary restraining order, to get an injunction, but not only that, you're going to have to pay attorney's fees to this lawyer for coming in and doing all of this work. So that starts to add up. So with nursing facilities, although the, the difficult patient one is going to be probably the hardest case um, that's going to be one that is going to be, you know, a judge's determination. It is a lot of times where there's now more things that you can do if the patient is willing to do it so that the nursing facility is going to be required to take them back again. Um, again, it's going to have to be patients or patients' families, in the case of a guardian, that is willing to actually file some sort of lawsuit. And it may be something where we go in and look at the case and say, okay, you don't necessarily have to take them back, but you need to find them some other place. So it's not on the, you know, it's not the onerous of the hospital to have to then place this somewhere, somewhere else. It goes back to the nursing facility, and it's their job to place them somewhere else so that they're not stuck here. Because really what it's come down to is, I don't mean stuck here, but you all know what I mean. You know, the, the hospital, although a great place, is not a skilled nursing facility. There's huge differences I have learned over now practicing this sort of law. Um, so they need to be in some sort of other placement. So anything that we can do to let these facilities know we're going to start doing things if, indeed, you guys don't take these patients back. And it's going to be a combination between what the hospital wants to do, because that's a hospital decision, and what the patients are going to want to do, because um, it can be separate actions. Uh, but if you can get the patient at least to talk to us, at least to get advised on their rights, then hopefully we can advise them um, on doing things to either get back into the facility or making the facility find them an appropriate place to be discharged rather than just leaving them at the hospital. I'm early. I usually don't end early. Do you guys have any other questions? I think this area of law is pre it's pretty clean cut except for um, the difficult, the difficult patient. I think that that is probably where the most litigation is going to happen, assuming that we had patients who were willing to do it. And so it's not one of these where it's a really a gray area. So I think it's on our part is that if the facility doesn't want to back, then the patient doesn't want to go back, if we can get the facility to take them back. Yeah, and I, that's the problem that we've run into with, with trying to get these cases. But that is then when it comes down to um, the hospital decision as opposed to the patient decision. So the patient has the right to file a complaint with the ombudsman, but the hospital also has a right, even if the patient isn't looking to go back, the hospital has to make the determination, okay, well, this nursing facility is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Is that something where we as a hospital then want to contact the ombudsman and, um, and deal with it as a, as a hospital? Like I said, I, I know one of my facilities doesn't want to do that because they're concerned that these places won't take their patients. <laughs> they, have, they have to. But again, it's, it's up to the hospital on what, on what they want to do. So it's, it really is every time you get one of these patients, it's going to be a, a two-way thing. Number one, does the patient want to do something that we can then do? And number two, does the hospital want to do something because this facility? And it may be a situation where you have a, the same facility who's doing it over and over again. And um, 
in that instance, maybe it is worth the hospital's while to do something about it. Maybe it's a new facility, they don't know this, and it may be a call from one of the social workers or one of the in-house counsel to say, hey, you're not following regulations, you have to do this, and see if you can do it that way. But it's frustrating because I know it, it happens here, it happens at Emanuel. Any place that has a busy ER gets these, these patients. Um, I know Emanuel gets a lot because they have psych, and so they'll try to drop them off, drop them off there. And I know it's been a very frustrating thing for the hospital. It's been frustrating for me because you don't, the patients don't really want to do anything because they're angry at the facility, and so the facility knows that, and so nothing ever happens to them. So. When you speak of involuntary patient discharge, and this has been around skilled facilities, um, can you talk a little bit about patients that are discharged from here but really don't want to leave, um, and what, if we have a plan, a place for them to go an accepting facility, what, what we can do? So that, again, is kind of a hospital thing. I think I, I've said before that if, if the hospital is not the appropriate level of care and you can discharge them, you have a place to discharge them, then the bill starts going to them. And I think I've, I've said before, I think the hospital um, can threaten to say, look, we, we can come after you for this. You're going to have those patients who are just, um, you know, yeah. Well, it's not that, and I don't know what that situation is. I don't know why there are some that just won't leave. But I, I think that, that that is more of a hospital situation than it is because it's the hospital's right on what do we want to do with that because it's clearly not the level of care. You can go after them for the bill and should go after them for the bill because Medicaid's not going to pay it. Um, but they also know they don't have any money, so they don't care. And then it's a matter of because then you get the complaint filed right if you, if you discharge them. And that's why I think that one is particularly a hospital decision on that one I do. I was surprised at how many times that happens. Next time I'm hungry, I'm just going to go get admitted and just not. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised to find out how often that happens. When people come to the hospital and they just won't leave. So. When you think they're filing an appeal, who are they appealing to? Department of Health and Human Services. So it's an administrative appeal to begin with. Um, they would file an appeal with the administrative, or with Department of Health and Human Services if they get denied at that level, they actually have a right to then file a district court action to appeal that level. But the first one would be with DHHS. And does the ombudsman automatically become involved then at that point? Yeah. Yeah. He, he, automat he or she automatically becomes involved at that point. Because that was what happened with our, with our other case, um, is we ended up getting the ombudsman involved. And um, so I have, I have a couple of minutes, so I'll tell my story. So we, we get the ombudsman involved and we get all of the medical records because uh, we want to see the medical records and see the reporting of what happened with this particular patient to see whether, because he was, he was discharged on the, um, he is a harm to himself or whatever. So we got, we requested all of their medical records so we could see what was going on. And that was where we saw that on one page he had, that he had a guardian and on the very next page they had let him sign his own DNR. And so I contacted Adverse Counsel. They did have an attorney. And, and I said, have you seen the medical records? And she said, I was really hoping you hadn't. Um, <laughs> so, so at that point, we actually negotiated where they placed this individual in another facility. Um, and we had to replace the guardian because the original guardian um, had died. And so we, we assisted in replacing the original guardian. And then they paid for that guardian to go back and forth and visit this person because the only place they could find for him was um, Plattsmouth. So it, it was negotiated. It turned out well because he wasn't then in this facility anymore. Um, so the, when you get them involved, and that's why with patients, I would say that doesn't necessarily have to be the end all is where you go back. In this particular instance, we negotiated him getting placed in a different facility where he was happy. Um, and so they got rid of him but they had to find, they're the ones who had to find this other facility, which is what should have happened in the first place. Um, and, you know, luckily they had an attorney who was able to negotiate with us. But that's, that's what should have happened in the first place, and it was only through this appeal and through the ombudsman getting involved that we're, we were able to negotiate to get him placed somewhere else. So it isn't a thing where they necessarily have to go get placed back. Um, we would like to do something where they get placed back, at least keep, keeping them there out of the hospital until we can figure something else out, because um, that gets him off of your doorstep. 
Um, but then they don't necessarily, and, and with families, this is something we would tell them, is it wouldn't end up where we necessarily have to then keep them there. We could negotiate to get them work at getting them placed somewhere else that maybe they are happy and that the hospital or that the nursing facility would be happy to then have them out, but actually do what they're required to do, which is find them a, a different placement. Anything else? Okay, I'm done. Ha, ha, ha.